I went to Rookies, that's where we were sent, to Ballarat, and we were trained as uh, wireless operators or telegraphers that became out later on. They just told us that's what we were, yeah. About four or five months there, learning Morse code, and after we could read Morse code and send it 20 words per minute, we were off to uh, various places, and I was sent to Wagga. That's where I met Phil. <laughs> we met on New Year's Eve in 1942, first time we met. Uh, so we were supposed to be on shift at 12 o'clock. We didn't get back to 2 o'clock. <laughs> but uh, we were rather fortunate. A very good friend of ours was in charge of the shift, so we, we were excused. I was posted to uh, Canberra to a squadron, a bowfighter squadron, and uh, only as not a pilot or anything like that, but just in communications, of course. Finally, uh, the squadron moved on and I was posted to a place called Meraki in Dutch New Guinea. I spent 17 months up there. Well, the, the place Meraki itself, I mean, we were just camped in amongst coconut trees, that's all. The tent was there. It was a rather dangerous place. I mean, uh, quite often we could hear coconuts landing on, a, on the roof of the tent, or, you know, boom, on the tent. <laughs> And I can remember one fellow walking, walking to the mess and swinging his arm and a coconut hit him there and broke his arm. But oh, lovely coconut milk, beautiful. <laughs> there wasn't much you could do to amuse yourself. It just went day by day and we did have pictures of course to go and watch. But that was a bit of a dangerous game too because you'd sit on these, what we called kalapi logs. We'd sit there and then the mosquitoes would eat you to death. But still, you went to see the pictures, didn't you? That was about our only enjoyment. Now, when I was a kid, I could not stand cauliflower. Oh. Towards the end of the 17 months up there, they served cauliflower, and I've never enjoyed anything so much in all my life. Fresh vegetables, my word. We used to have what was called dried potato stuff. It came in tins, and you mixed it up with water. Oh ghastly stuff it was and the same with the dried egg that we used to mix up but to have fresh vegetables my word it was wonderful i was then posted to moratoi our unit took part in the landing of tarakan that's on the island of borneo i was then in uh, what was called a fighter control unit and of course they needed communications just like anything else. Our job was we were sitting on the radios. If any aeroplanes were sighted round about, we had to communicate. We sailed up into the middle of Dutch New Guinea to a place called Tanamira. It was really a rough sea. Another fellow and I sat on the back of that boat eating dog biscuits and jam while the other four fellows were being seasick. So. I thought that was rather remarkable that <laughs> I wasn't seasick. So the, the tricks that various cobbers pay on you. I'd come back to the tent one day and want a, want a soft drink? Yes, certainly. Wiped it down and of course what they'd done, they'd put two malaria, what we call these little yellow tablets in it. And they were ghastly. And of course I took one mouthful of this and I'll... Fortunately, we only put up with about three raids while I was at Meraki, and uh, the only place you die for a slit trench, of course. But we didn't have a great deal to worry about. After the 17 months there, I was uh, off to uh, Tarakan, as I said, in Borneo. No aeroplane landed at Tarakan on the airstrip at Tarakan for quite a long while after we got there because there was a Japanese gun up in the hills somewhere that could always land bombs on the thing. And yet we had a paper saying that aircraft were taking off from Tarakan quite a long time before they really did. But that's, you know, one thing about propaganda. <laughs> it seemed ages, of course, but I don't think I was there for more than about three or four months. Any time at all seemed a long time because we were rather in a, a very perilous position. Quite often these American uh, Bombers went over the top of us to bomb the airstrip and we were always worried that they dropped it a bit short, we might have pinged it. <laughs> and we were there of course when VP came and I was very fortunate. I was flown back a week after VP Day, back to Australia 
and Phil and I were married in September 22 in 1945 and we both uh, received our discharge while we were on our honeymoon. We were just odd bods that went to various units. See, the squadron, they have their reunions every year, every Anzac Day and whatnot, but uh, we odd bods, no, don't. Now we regret a lot of things, but you went away and you didn't have any thought to the future, did you? I mean, apart from the fact that you get engaged and you're going to hope you'll get back to get married, but I mean, I don't think you thought much more than that. The thing, of course, about my service was I met Philly. That's a big thing. <laughs> I don't know that I've won the war with Phil, but still. <laughs>